And then there were two. <laughs> I'm going to just do a little showing off to start and pronounce your name properly. Oh, well, that should be interesting. I know how to do it now. You taught me. I did. And you well, know how to put on your slides when it's time for that, right? I'm actually going to try it right now just to make sure I'm doing it right. You did it. All right. Well done. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Jörg Lorscheider, a native of Germany. That's right. Who really, you, you can't really hear the accent. <laughs> I was three years old no. when I came. But you, you spoke and see fluently? No, I mean, my parents spoke German at home, but I, uh, you know, I always answered in English. In those times, like in the late 60s, we were trying not to be German. Right. That's fine. <laughs> well, I'm a purebred Syrian, and Syrian was only spoken in the house when we were, we children were not to understand what was being discussed. <laughs> right. Which helped me from a cultural standpoint as much as I would have liked in later years. Ten life lessons from a 30-year product development career by Jörg Lorscheider. Let's go to it. All right. Well, just a little bit uh, about me. So I, um, I've spent my entire career really in product development. Uh, but I think what's significant is that I've in that time done kind of all ways of trying to do product development well. So I started with my first company it was, uh, we're going to build our own engineering team. Then uh, I founded a, a company doing um, outsourced product development it was there for 10 years. And then I uh, moved on to another company that had a completely different business model in product development, which is a completely outsourced business model. And then now I work for Omnica, which is a 40 year, almost 40 year company doing product development. And I also have my own uh, product development firm uh, called TechFlex, which is an outsourced firm that does uh, development using resources in the Ukraine. So I have a lot of different experiences uh, that I thought might be interesting uh, in that time. So uh, proposition for TechFlex is I have Ukrainian people. Well, uh, the, the, the proposition is, um, you know, a lot of small to medium sized companies don't have relationships offshore. They don't have as much money. Uh, and I, we see a lot of them making mistakes. They go to places that are very inexpensive, but they really don't get what they um, what they want. So what, what what we're trying to do is bridge the gap and provide very high quality engineering services, software, uh, and hardware, uh, but at a I would say a mid tier cost. But uh, so we have people in the United States doing project management, and then the engineering people in the Ukraine. So we have very strong partners in the like Ukraine. That. You might talk to your marketing coach at some point about that to tighten up that value prop. Just so. <laughs> okay, I was, it wasn't what I was thinking about when we were doing this. So um, I want to talk, you know, about different business models uh, and um, when does it really make sense to outsource? What's the best uh, time? And I'm hoping that we'll have some good discussion on that. And um, what are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the typical things that I see or have seen over the years? that uh, we can draw some, some experience from. So let's go to, sorry. So as an example, I, um, I'm sure all of you have done remodeling in your home. You've done different uh, projects and you have to choose uh, which way you wanna do it, what type of provider you wanna do it with. Uh, you can get do it yourself cabinets, you can do all kinds of things. Same with same with larger items. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the types of, let me do something here, sorry. Um, so the types of uh, service providers that exist out there. So this is pretty straightforward. I mean, there are full-time uh, dedicated infrastructure with full-time employees. That's like like an Omnica, but there are many others around the country. They have um, a larger overhead, but they have you know more uh, um, dedicated employees. Maybe been there a little longer, and so I 
I think that they're a little more stable, but they're usually more expensive as well. Um, there's a hybrid infrastructure, which is something like TechLex does, where we have um, project managers that are dedicated employees, but their resources are, are uh, contracted. And then you have actually, and then I did work for a company for about two years that actually only had contractors. So there was actually no, uh, other than the owner, there were no dedicated employees on salary. Um, and that can work as well. So all these models work. Uh, they may or may not be right for you at a particular time. And uh, so that's kind of what I was. The last one seemed pretty uh, risky. I mean, relatively speaking. No yeah, one... I, I, I think it can be. Um, again, it comes down to who you're, who you're dealing with, right? In this case, in my case, where I was working with someone, they had a lot of experience. They'd been around the contractors they used. They'd been working with for 20 years. So I would say it was not so risky, but in general, I think it can be more risky. It's also um, difficult to gauge their quality because you know they can show you lots of pictures of projects they've done, but what does that really mean? I mean, you've probably all seen um, people's portfolios. They could be projects that someone did, you know, when they were working for somebody else, mm -hmm. and now they're using it as their portfolio piece. So it's hard to it's hard to make judgments uh, about takeaway for a manufacturer. Listening to all about which way I should go. Well, I think if you're, you know, if you're a, a, a large company, let's say, you probably don't want to. You probably want to have a dedicated uh, infrastructure group like an Omnica or some of the, some of the big ones. You know, there's Cymetica, There's many others. Um, you probably want to have the security of that because that's a, a U.S.-based company and everything is, you know, they have processes, procedures, legal all of these things, I think that the risk is lower, but usually the cost is higher. So if cost isn't the, the major driving factor, it's probably a safer option for a big company or a manufacturer of medical devices in the United States. Could you answer this, pardon me, I'd like uh, folks on the call to type in if they have a point of view about, because I, I would, I think of this, I know it's not exactly, but it's like big, medium, small in terms of structure and cost that it's going from top to bottom and if if you choose the wrong one if you go smaller to save or middle or i don't know if there are any experiences about folks with things that they've built in the past where they wish they had picked a different category that'd be interesting to know yeah i mean the perfect example that i often hear in the market is look we and this isn't with development but it's more with manufacturing but i think it still applies look we went with um Flextronics and they didn't have time for us. You know, they were too big to really consider you a, a, an important client. Uh, and so they weren't getting the attention that they really required. So that's an example of the kind of situation you could find yourself in. Um, Rick says, too big can be so expensive that you can't finish. Interesting. Yes, uh, you, you mean running out of money? Uh, or I'll, uh, I'll bring them on and uh, Joanne, I'll, I'll bring you on as well. I know you'll just be voice. That's fine. Rick, you're on mute and you were saying that you can't finish. Is that because you run out of money or what? Well, it's, it's not exactly a Goldilocks thing, but you know, too big, too small, but you can, uh, you can realize that halfway through quoting their services, you couldn't possibly afford them because they, they're set up with the infrastructure to deal with, with equally large infrastructures, and that can make them very expensive. The nice thing about a big company is lots of history, fairly standardized. Uh, you you know what you're working with, and they're more likely to have somebody who knows exactly what you're doing, which is good. And of course, if you go the other route with a small company, you want to you want to have much more of a personal knowledge of exactly who they are, what they've worked on. Um, I know I, I know I went in with, I know I went in to help a small business. They had a young guy starting something, but there were some things that he didn't know. But if I was bringing in a consulting group, I would want to have some, I wouldn't want to just talk to the head guy. I want to talk to the people that were going to be doing the work because they really are more important than some broad history of a huge company because you're only dealing with a small one. Yes, Fair enough. I, I agree. Joanne? 
Hi, um, York, I have a question. <clears throat> um, I recently hired somebody to create some packaging for me. Yes. And I, they had a room that was packed full of great projects that they had done. It really looked good. He said, okay, we're gonna have a start off meeting and we're gonna do all of, you get all the requirements down. And they didn't even do that. They just started designing on their own. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't talk to it, obviously. So my question to you is, what would you do to vet, appropriately vet somebody from a design perspective, even when you're seeing great looking products? Yeah, I think um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to one of my concluding slides is that. Uh, you don't have to run there. Just tell us. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, so you know, the thing that most people ask for when they uh, are evaluating us, let's say, uh, is experience with similar projects. So I think they gave you that, right? They showed you a bunch of good stuff. Uh, speed, how fast they could uh, develop it. I assume that was acceptable to you. And then uh, references also, talk to people who have worked with them and uh, you know, credible people, obviously. And then cost is probably the next, the last piece. So I think, you know, references is probably key here. I don't know if you talk, if you talked to any references, Joanne, but uh, I probably would have wanted to talk to somebody who'd worked with them before. In all honesty, doing that kind of thing was new to me. Mm -hmm. I went by what they were displaying and what mm -hmm. they told me they would do, and they didn't do what they told me they were going to do. Number one, which we did have in writing. Um, but I kind of went by the projects that they had done. Um, yeah, a lot. Of, I mean, that's one of the things I always tell people in this business is we sell, we sell confidence and trust, uh, not as not as much as we sell, you know, engineering. You you really have to, um, you really have to build trust, uh, and so it's sometimes difficult uh, to. And I think when if you haven't done it before, I think it's extremely difficult. Any service provider, right? I mean, look at. Uh, We'll have some examples later, or just look at kitchen kitchen options as we were talking about. You know, we didn't know which kitchen designer to use. We had, you know, a full service kitchen designer. We had a do it yourself. We had something in the middle. We didn't know, so we ended up picking the do it yourself one. So we designed with their help. We designed the kitchen, and then we used a third party installer, and we saved uh, a little bit of money in the end. And we wish we had actually gone with the full kitchen designer who was way more expensive, but by the end of the day, it would have been done right the first time and we wouldn't have had to gone through a, a huge torture of getting things done. So it's the same, the same kind of thing. You know, it's very difficult. References are really important or other people you know that have like, like the MDG group, of course, where you could say, I need a package, a good packaging designer um, and get referrals just like you would pick a doctor, right? You you pick doctors often through referrals. Oh, I know somebody who's who's a good, you know, this or that. So yeah, I think that's a, a strong right. way to do it. Pardon? I know that every time I refer someone, I feel as though I'm giving away some of my own brand equity, my own credibility. If I refer Jan and she doesn't yes. know what she's doing, then why should I, you know, each time? So I agree with that analogy and I appreciate it. And I wish Joanne would have talked to me about her packaging. <laughs> yeah, when was this, Joanne? Well, I was going to, cre I've created a chocolate bar mold, a chocolate bar. When I was said, this? Huh? When? Oh, what? I've been working on this for a while. So I created the mold, had the molds built, the molds are great, and I need the packaging done for my chocolate bar. So <laughs> I hired a company out here. I wanted to keep it local to keep them working. And so, um, I knew where I wanted to print it because it's a reputable company. And so I told the, the owner of this development company, I told them I wanted to do it at Warnicky. And he says, oh yeah, I'm best friends with the CEO of Warnicky. I'm like, oh, awesome. You understand their processes. You've used them before. You should understand this. Well, he created a package for me that Warnicky turned around and said, I can't produce this for you. So I've now had to, ha I've now, because I've paid all that money to them and we have certain work done, had to, had to have a die cut and a man, and, and being that I'm a little person doing this, had a, a die cutter, manual <laughs> die cutter, where I'm gonna actually print it, I'll print them out myself and then I'll run them through a manual die cutter to get going. 
until I can find somebody else that can actually produce it. I'm considering going back and requesting money back because of this issue and nobody else has been able to come back and say they can produce it. But I didn't know enough about the industry, unfortunately. It's a learning curve for me. Well, it's also not, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily feel bad about it. I can give you countless examples. This is something that happens all the time is, especially in industrial design, uh, where you get some, ex you know, incredibly beautiful designs, but they can't be manufactured. This happens all the time. So um, I see people shaking their heads. So yeah, this, this, this is a common occurrence in the, in the design community. Uh, so you really need somebody that has the practical experience on top of uh, the design knowledge. And it's sometimes hard to find. Yeah, the, the design is awesome though. It's gonna be worth yeah. it. cutting it for a while. <laughs> Thanks mm -hmm. so much. Well, Jan, you had a question and if you have a moment to call Joanne after this call, see if there's anything. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah. I, I mean, I worked in a company, one of my first projects when I first got out of college was um, finding out about all the equipment in the company because someone had ordered a half a million cartons that were a quarter of an inch too short to run on the equipment we had. Oh, gosh. I thought you were going to tell the popcorn story, which is far more appetizing. Oh, popcorn, that one I had to do quick because I was pregnant, but <laughs> yeah, microwave popcorn. Again, circumstances for projects, yes. Oh, I loved being pregnant because I could put my hands on my hips and say, I've got a deadline. Are we going to meet it? <laughs> nice. Wow. That's very resourceful. Yes. So for packaging, a dedicated infrastructure seemed best and most effective because why? Um, because they actually were invested in the company and would take the time to actually learn all the pieces to make it run properly through their understanding requirements for the equipment, materials that were possible, how the product interacted with anything to give you the shelf life. They would just, it, it just worked better from the different companies I've been in if you can have dedicated people that were actually doing that kind of work as packaging because they understood how they had to fight through different things to get uh, the money they needed for the sampling, for the testing and doing that work. Where when you brought in contractors, they might have great ideas, but like Joanne said, it just didn't work with what we had in the facilities. So um, I've, I've always, and I hated doing it because I'll come in as a consultant and I'll work with a company for a little while and I'll turn around and say, you need to hire a full timer. <laughs> get this work done. You can't afford to keep paying me. And um, I've, I've lost out on a few, but I've also got some retainers that way. So it's, uh, I just find it works better if you can hire a full-time person that's very invested in your company. Yeah, it's, it's called professionalism as well. You know, there's a lot of people out there that unfortunately in, in our society, of course, everyone's uh, trying to make money and sometimes that uh, supersedes their uh, desire to be honest or their desire to be fully transparent, let's say. And that's where we lead into some of these problems. Thanks, Jan. Peter? Peter? Yes. Hi, everybody. Hi. You wrote in. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure with the way this Zoom works, but uh, I'm not sure if anybody. The way it works is you I, just I wrote something make... nice, and instead of me reading it, I thought I would promote you to panelists. Okay. Thank would you. Share yeah. with us your thoughts. So my, my question is, or comment is that um, invariably, as, uh, as, the early man, as the product is presented for manufacturing, the, the, the early efforts and uh, manufacturing runs result in some sort of um, evolution uh, of, of the product or, or product, the product's attributes. And you need close cooperation from manufacturing engineering people uh, to, uh, to uh, allow the product to evolve before it actually goes into, um, into a hard and fast manufacturing. My experience is that um, with, uh, with small operators like, like um, Jörg's uh, last two, uh, they're not likely to have the ability or the interest in working with you to evolve your, your, your design as, as they start uh, punching it through manufacturing. Uh, and uh, whereas if you work with a bigger company, like his first example, um, you are more likely to, they, they are more likely to have the resources and the interest in the, um, in helping you evolve the product. I think that's a great point. Um, 
Yes, uh, having the knowledge of manufacturability is something that really comes a lot through experience. You have to have a broad understanding from it when you're a designer uh, of different methods and processes, and not everybody has that, and that, that takes a lot of um, uh, experience. We, uh, we also at Omnica do um, transfer to manufacturing. We work with contract manufacturers to make sure that they understand the the workflow, they understand how it goes. We, we make modifications if necessary to get the, or we call it the new product introduction process streamlined and, and getting that product into production as quickly as possible. Right. And if you don't have someone that can work with you uh, on that basis, you end up what, uh, what I might call attribute creep. Yes. Some of the uh, may, may be insignificant, but maybe very significant in a marketing sense, attributes of the product are forced to creep as the product is force fitted into a somewhat inflexible uh, manufacturing process. Yeah, and those changes that late in the process are the most expensive changes typically. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. So thank uh, you, Peter. While some of you might be thinking, we're talking about 10 life lessons, we're on lesson one, holy hell, how long is this presentation? I'll say that having worked on the presentation with your that one was absolutely the deepest one, <laughs> I think. You no, it was, it was good though, a lot, a lot of good points and uh, yeah. I also yeah, want to as- Hopefully some, some of the next ones will be more interesting when you see all the you know crazy things I've done in my life. Interesting, but I will put in a, a plug for your, the reason I asked him to do this presentation and I'm actually gonna read his uh, value prop, which he's not memorized, I bet. <laughs> To small to mid-sized health and tech manufacturers, Jorg is the guy you call when you are developing an electromechanical device or app because over his 30-year career, he's guided more than a thousand companies on the best development pathway. It is inconceivable that it's more than a thousand, but we did the math. <laughs> it is kind of inconceivable, but it is you know 20 years of uh, as a service provider i've seen a lot of projects i've seen a lot of customers okay sanjeev has a comment but let's move on for right now and we'll come back okay thanks uh -huh. so um one of the things is um uh, maybe i should have there we go so I was planning to buy a stock, and I'm sure all of you have had some some related experience that uh, I did a lot of analysis. I was looking at charts. I was looking at uh, everything. I talked to my wife. I talked to friends. I was trying to, you know, I was trying to play it safe. I didn't want to take any risk. And of course, in all that time, I I missed the opportunity. So I think one of the things is you can't. Uh, you can't get rid of all risk in product development. You have to move forward, and um, you know, you know, if you're just lying dead in the water, it's it, it's it's not so lying dead in the water is nothing but a comfortable alternative because it's it's no risk is never going to make you go anywhere. So I think uh, that's something that I see in a lot of clients. They want to be so sure that they get it right that they totally miss the opportunity. And it also adds a lot of expense uh, into any kind of process because it adds time. And so that was my uh, life lesson number two. Um, the life lesson number three. So I was in Quebec City, which is a beautiful place. I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but uh, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I was going to be speaking at a tech conference. This is probably, I don't know, 20 years ago or more. And uh, I really had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I, uh, so I, I was really, uh, did not go well. Uh, it was a pretty boring experience. So I think one of the things about how this relates to product development is you really need to be prepared. So uh, we have a lot of clients. I've seen many, many clients come in and they really don't know what the product's supposed to do. They don't know their customer very well. And you need to know that uh, extremely well while it's cheap to do so. So uh, it doesn't cost much to go talk to people to understand what the product is, build maybe basic prototypes, whatever, get the knowledge because otherwise you're going to be 
um, making changes in the design process, which gets very costly and time consuming. So your, your, your advice is, is to the manufacturer to make sure you completely understand your value prop to your client? Your uh, I, my, my advice is to people doing product, trying to get a project done, whether it's a manufacturer or, uh, or a startup or whatever. Um, you really need to know your customer. You need to be prepared. You need to have a business plan. You need to be ready because even later on, when you're in the midst of product development, there are always unknowns that happen. And if you can't address the unknowns quickly and make decisions quickly, uh, you you won't, you know, you're just going to stall the project. So um, knowing all this information, gathering all this stuff ahead of time allows you to make those decisions very quickly mm -hmm. and keeps the project moving. So that's, that was my life lesson number three. Thank you. Do it yourself. Um, hey, everybody can do it themselves, right? I, I have to uh, admit to a huge failure. This, this is actually a project that I've been working on. I do a lot of hand, handyman projects at, around the house. You know, I built a coffee table for my daughter. I, do, I like to do stuff with my hands. So, um, so I was doing this, my wife bought a steam oven and I'm putting the steam oven in the cabinet, so I have to build this frame. And of course the frame is painted a custom color and blah, blah, blah. So I had to do, you know, get the material, cut the frame, then I made a mistake. You can see it there. And, and basically last night I installed it. This is a true story. Last night I installed it and it was completely bad, wrong. So <laughs> my wife called um, a professional to do it. So, um, my lesson here <laughs> is you can you can do everything yourself but it's going to cost you um so this this is really meant for people i see this happen a lot with um and, and i'm not disparaging anyone uh with with people that come out of academia you know they're really uh trained to learn well so they think they can learn everything that they need to learn in order to get a product development going and, and i think my answer is yes of course you can do that but you won't you won't get to where you're going fast enough so you really need a professional uh, team to do product development you can't just think i'm going to learn everything and do it myself this is very entertaining thank you <laughs> it's a true story literally last night i was so mad because it didn't come out i was like i, I, was, I was so disappointed so um this is me I, yes, I did actually catch that fish. Um, you know, you might think. Uh, How heavy is it? It's 110 pounds. Wow. And you pulled it over the side? I did. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, let's just say, you know, it, it, on the surface, it's easy, right? You throw the line in and, and the fish went on and I reeled it in, right? But. Uh, what isn't easy is, you know, it took me six years of trips. I probably lost six other of these, this size fish over those years. Uh, I had to learn what the conditions were. I had to learn how the fish behaved. I had to do all this stuff. So, you know, my point being that on the surface, things look easy, but in product development, really nothing is really that easy. Uh, nothing's really that simple. Um, you know, you might have a, a, a single part product. It might just be one part, but you have all the intricacies of, you know, how do you mold that part? How do you, what's the tooling strategy? What where are the gate locations? Where are the, you know, all, where are the bosses? Where are the sink marks? All the different things that happen in plastic part design, you, you know, for someone not skilled in it, you would think, hey, this is, this is a piece of cake. So that's, that's my lesson number five is things on the surface. Athletes are a good example here too, right? They make stuff look easy. You think, ah, I can go do that, but you can't. Uh, Dwayne wants to know the taste of the fish and I am more concerned about the prehistoric nature of the fish. Okay, so just so you know, that fish is probably about 50 years old and it is a grouper and it, it tastes, actually grouper tastes very good generally but when they're this big, they're not quite as good, as good tasting, but they're definitely edible. And how, how long did it take you to eat 50 pounds of, 100 I, pounds of I fruit? still have fish in my freezer. Of oh, this fish? Yes. When did you catch it? Uh, about a year ago. Oh, okay. 
it's vacuum bagged. It actually worked, it tastes pretty good when you uh, vacuum bag everything. But still, it's enough for uh, all of us to have some? <laughs> you know, I'm at a point where I really need to get get it e eaten. So, I, you know, I might have to just ship all you guys some fish in the freezer bags or something. Okay, another benefit, Andre, of being in the <laughs> Yeah, um, another MDG benefit. Premium benefit. <laughs> So I, uh, I don't know if any, any of you are car people. Uh, I am, I particularly love classic cars. So I purchased this original 1967 Pontiac Grand Prix convertible. Uh, I loved it. Um, I was excited, I drove, you know, I drove it, I drove it down PCH and, you know, took cruises in it. It was just, it was awesome. Um, but over time, I started, you know, I liked working on it, but then I couldn't really work on the engine much because if I wanted to do something major, I would have to, I couldn't drive the car. And then I couldn't enjoy it the way I wanted to. So I eventually, I also spent, you know, thousands of dollars. I, I underestimated how much money it would actually take to, to fix up this car, even though it was a driver. So I, uh, I uh, eventually I sold it. I lost interest. And um, and I lost I also lost some space, which is another thing. But I think what you need to the, the point is that money is the fuel that keeps development running. If you run out of money, uh, your stakeholders lose interest, the project stalls, you're really not going to get where you need to go. And anytime a project stalls, it's really bad news. So, um, so it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna cost a lot more money than you think just like most things. Uh, so I see Andre on there. You have a comment, Andre? He wrote me in all caps immediately upon this thing. You're on mute, Andre, um, as soon as you put the picture of the car up. Okay. Uh, so yes, this is very apropos for your presentation because I am a car guy. I had a 1966 Buick electric convertible. Oh, with beautiful. The, with the 455 cubic inch engine, the nice. largest, largest GM engine on a production line. And it was a great car. And believe me, you brought that great memory. So this is so far the best MDG premium <laughs> presentation ever. Just because of this slide? Just because of this car. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of you don't care about cars. Or this is, I'm this not is a car guy, but I sure wouldn't mind getting driven around in that. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, um, you know, everybody knows how this goes. I don't know how many of you have done remodeling projects or even major remodeling projects, but I've done several. Um, I, uh, they are painful. And, you know, we got, a, we got an estimate to do the remodel of this house after we had some uh, serious water damage. And it, uh, it kind of went up from there. And so we more than doubled the, the estimate by the time we were done, it was 16 months versus, uh, I think the original estimate was eight months. So, you know, things that happen, it's like going into design, again, not being prepared, like we were talking about, you know, you don't know exactly what you want. Um, things are constantly changing. You're finding stuff in the house that needs to be fixed that you didn't know was buried in the walls. You know, all, all the stuff you've seen all the shows. And um, in product development, it's the kind of same thing. So the more you know what you want, the more streamlined the project's gonna go, the less, um, the less it's gonna cost. Uh, it's still gonna cost more than you think, always does. I don't know, you know, I think maybe one in 10 projects come in under budget, maybe, um, and. So what's the implication for a manufacturer? Well, again, you, you, have to, you have to be prepared and you have to budget more than you think it's gonna cost. So even if someone gives you, or four people give you quotes, you know, pretty much make sure you have enough contingency budget, or at least you know where you're going to get more money if you need to, uh, in order to make sure that you can finish that project because it's you don't know what's going to happen, so you need to have the contingencies. Eddie, you're on mute. Eddie's on mute. Uh, an another classic car survivor. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what did you have? And actually, a, a 1966 Mustang convertible, beautiful car, yeah. had loads of joy with it, but exactly the same. But the, the best thing about selling it was I sold it to somebody who had like a four or five-year-old son 
And although there was lots of work to be done on the car, you could see that, you know, because that I had children about the same age and they grew up with that car and it's still going now, I hope. But I actually use the car whenever I talk to anybody about any project and the costs. And you, but putting it into a context of like you say with the house or, you know, have you remodeled a kitchen or a bathroom? Did it ever come in on budget? Why would you expect this to do that? Because yeah. you're a professional. Well, and that is actually uh, the reason to go with people. Because again, if you try to do something first, you know, first time you do anything, it takes longer, costs way more. But if you go to somebody who's got a process, then you have more reliability. It's still going to, still things going to come up. But if you ever said to me, you know, hey, have you ever tried to remodel your bathroom? Why do you think I'm going to do any better than that? I would probably <laughs> not think that's a great marketing pitch. Well, no, how many bathrooms have you ha, ha, how many bathrooms have you remodeled it goes back to that question no, yeah, so and also it, i think in contractors are generally many of them are very unprofessional we're, we're talking about professional services so it is a bit better but nevertheless um you need to have contingencies because it, you know you don't know what you don't know and things change all the time go on jan come off mute and tell us your little boast oh we had our kitchen remodeled here and it came in under budget because they screwed up a couple things they weren't supposed to and we charged them for it. <laughs> oh, okay. you didn't write that in your note. No, uh -huh. we, uh, well, they, they messed up. So it was either. So you made them pay for it. Yeah, uh, it, it worked out really good because we knew what we wanted and we made up our mind before we started and that's what they did. And the two bathroom remodels came in right on time too. We had a little trouble with the remodel on this new house because COVID is just slowing everything down. Oh yeah. So, you don't uh, have a COVID slide, do you? I don't have a COVID slide. I didn't address COVID here. I, I, I'm assuming, I'm, I'm optimistic that COVID will one day be gone. Well, it's the president's been cured, so. Oh yeah, that's right. Cured. We're on our way. That's why there's so <laughs> many that are sick there in the White House. Yeah. So, I stayed. Um, oops. Oh, so, uh, sorry about that. My finger on the change to attendee button. I apologize, Jan. Sorry, Jan. Um, so I've done a lot of remodeling, obviously. <laughs> and uh, so we downsized recently, sold the bigger house, moved to a condo, found out it had a bunch of problems. So we remodeled that as well. But what I found is that uh, how this relates to, you know, every quote we got, everyone has optimistic schedules. Everybody says, oh, I'm going to get it done in this many weeks, that many weeks. Um, they're basically all unrealistic. And uh, my point is that you can always find someone who's gonna tell you what you wanna hear when it comes to schedules. Um, they also know that once you start working with them, it's very difficult to switch, right? There's been all the learning and all the things going on and you can't just switch, just like you can't switch contractors midstream. I mean, you can, but it's costly. Mm -hmm. um, you can't switch the service providers for design and engineering to midstream either. And so you need to be aware that, um, you know, people do tend to fudge on the schedules and say, oh yeah, we can meet your time frame, et cetera. Uh, I think one thing that we're very conscious of here at Omnica, for example, is trying to be realistic on schedules. And if customers are not realistic about their schedules, we actually decline to work with them because we won't know they won't be happy in the end. And that's not something that you mm -hmm. see very often in the industry. Uh, most people are always looking to get more business, of course. And uh, so you have to be aware and be um, honest with yourself about schedules. That's, uh, you remind me, I was talking to Jose Borquez this week and mm -hmm. uh, I said, whatever happened to that lead that uh, this program we did produced? He said, yeah, we talked to her and uh we gave her a an estimate and she walked at the price to a degree that um you know i said well can, can you go back and educate her about why it's much more and he said in my experience that client will never be happy she will always come back and say but you said but you said and all this other stuff and so he just said not a good fit yeah, then that's that's very true. Uh, some people you will never be happy no matter what you do, or they'll let you run through every hoop. Um, and it's funny uh, in the history of Omnica and history of a lot of uh, product development firms. You know, we we sometimes 
especially when we're starting out, when Anika started out, everyone was killing themselves working, you know, night and day, you know, 16 hour days to try to satisfy the customer, whoever that happened to be. And the fact is it, it, you can't ever satisfy them. So you're just killing yourself and customers are happy to let you do that, but it's no way to run a, pro, a company. You're gonna burn people out. You're not gonna have longevity. So that's uh, something that you have to be aware of as a service provider. But um, as, a, as, a, as a developer, someone who wants to develop a product, you need to be very um, attuned to what people are saying about schedule and, and heighten your senses to understand, uh, to make sure that that's an honest estimate uh, and, and maybe even compare, uh, if you find somebody else in a related industry, say how long, you know, ask them how long their project took and things like that to educate yourself about how, how long it really could take. 17 years ago, I worked at an ad agency in Syracuse. Don't ask me. It was post 9-11. I needed the work. And, uh, <laughs> I read a book about advertising. I think it was Confessions of an Ad Man. And um, the quote I remember, the only quote I remember from the book is um, when you're dealing with a client, it's yes, sir, no, sir, and all, sir. <laughs> I like it. Well, now, Mark Fine asks if you have ever fired a client. Oh, yes. Many times. Many times. Um, many times. You know, I think at this stage in, in Omnica, in my, my experience at this stage, we tend to weed them out before we have them. But there are times when uh, that filter doesn't work. And sometimes you get a client that's extremely demanding or... Um, yeah, it, I, I actually have a story that's that's I'm not able to share, but we recently actually did that at Omnica and, and basically um, fired the client. That's the story we want to hear. I know, but it's it's confidential. I can't talk about it. Okay, okay. Sorry. Jane writes, she also fired a client. The second one she had when she started, it hurt, but it was necessary. Well, that was brave. Especially when you're starting out, you know, and you don't have a lot of funds and you're you're just scraping along to try to make the whole business I work. I hired one this year too. It's very difficult. Even though it's going to be a tough year, I was like, I cannot do this. Yeah. Well, ultimately, if you look in the long term, and I think this is something that Amica looks at a lot, is we got to have, if we want to be successful in the long run, we have to have employees that are happy. Mentally. You know, we have to be happy. As a price. Can't, exactly. You can't burn people out. Otherwise, they won't let stay. Things like that. So... Number nine. Oh, here. Yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about different cost structures. Um, so you, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with um, how service providers um, sell their services. Some provide fixed costs, some work time materials. Sometimes you do a fixed phase, and then you requote the subsequent phases as you move through the project. Um, you can do phased estimates, um, or even some product development firms would take equity for doing some product development. I, uh, we are a strong proponent, and this may be controversial, of, of time and materials. And actually, Omnica does not work on anything but time and materials. And the reasoning there is, anytime you have a fixed cost, all you're really satisfying is the you know, your, the PMs and the accountants and so forth, but it, it really has a negative impact on the projects because projects by nature are uh, very fluid, things change. Um, you know, people talk about scope creep and all this other stuff. Well, scope creep doesn't matter, nor does it exist if we have time and materials because we're billing on a regular basis. If you, if you the customer, want to turn left instead of turn right, then fine, we'll do that. But obviously there's a cost associated with it, but it's reflected in the time of materials. It's the most flexible way to keep a project moving and getting it done quickly. Um, fixed costs of any kind tend to, every time there's a change, let's reevaluate the, the scope. You know, maybe if you're worried about with a big company, it could be, uh, let's get a committee together and all this other stuff. And it's just stalls projects. It's really not, uh, not as effective. So. I'm sure I'll hear some comments about that, but that's that's how we do business. Mark, you were first. Mark Fine, you were on mute. And what were we looking yeah. at? 
So uh, two comments. First, uh, about uh, fixed cost and time and materials. That's a tough one. You know, if it's a well-defined development project, you might be able to do a fixed you know, Oops. if there's a lot of research, you know, how do you predict that? I mean, that's insane. Uh, and you can't do fixed cost when there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and I was also going to mention, going back to the last slide, um, <clears throat> you know, when you have a startup, and I've had a few, everybody there is, is sleeping at the office, you know, just, you know, killer hours. We're having for some the reason a lot of your engineers came to work. Say again? You're coming in and out. Uh, my internet's unstable. Anyway, um, when people come to work for a company like yours, it's because they want to go home on weekends and after five. And so there's a disconnect between, you know, the client and the, and the provider, and they just have to kind of understand. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, that's true. Uh, I haven't really seen that much in our experience, though. I, I think that makes complete sense. Uh, but I, I haven't seen it much in our experience, mainly because generally we have so much more development experience than the startups that we tend to show progress much more quickly than they could ever imagine. And so they're usually pretty happy. Huh? Yeah, I just uh, agree with you. I never do fixed costs. That's a, a hard and fast rule I've got. I've done time and materials, phased estimates. And then if it's a startup and they want to reduce my rate, I will actually reduce my rate, but I'll do it for equity. Right. And you never reduce your rate below your, your Correct. cost. Yep. Right? You can't lose money on something. Oh, yeah. Well, it's still, still profitable. It's just I go right. down to my lowest rate, but add in equity on the other side. So have, I feel, I feel like everybody wins and there's some skin in the game. Have you ever gotten money out of the equity portion? I expect you soon. Okay, let us know no. if that actually happens. Yeah. That would be great. I, I, I totally applaud you for that. Uh, I've probably had equity in, you know, over my career in probably, I don't know, 20, 30 companies. I never saw a dime. Okay. I don't trust it for a moment. Well, that, that, that's why it, it's, it's a gravy on top, so I don't go below what I would have gone. That's why, yeah, exactly. You yep. don't want to do that. Rick? Oh, my question was, uh, in terms of in terms of just doing time and materials, which is my normal mode of operating too. What is your best way of dealing with customer originated or client originated project scope? I mean, there's always the uh, the easy the choices, and I wonder if you've got a better one than this. The choices are the memo reminding them that they've exceeded the scope of what we're doing. You know, we're doing something extra. It's going to cost more. Let me know if you let me know if you need a let me know if you need an estimate update or something like that. Um, what is the what is the because almost no matter what you do, sometimes they'll still come back and say, hey, you know, we thought this project was only going to cost thirty thousand. It really cost forty thousand. What's the deal? And I said, well, we nearly doubled the work, and you know, you're getting a fantastic deal. But what has worked best for you? Yeah. So here's here's what's worked best and uh, continues to work to this day is the. So what we do is we generally ask for a PO, let's say for a phase, whatever it is, let's say it's $100,000 just to make the numbers simple. Uh, we actually meet with uh, the clients every week and we bill them every week. So there's very little difference between, you know, the, the, the accounting and the actual progress. You so the point was every week, every week. That sounds um, excessive and cumbersome uh it well not really i mean billing isn't really that hard uh no, maybe it's not you i don't want to receive an invoice every week it'd be like well it's important and the reason is um well this is what this is what we do and uh the reason is is you want to couple tightly the progress of the project to the expenditure of the project that's really the key if you want to know the other way of doing it that's fine but uh, and by the, doing that, the co management, I'd be like, you just sent me a $2,000 invoice. Exactly. What did you accomplish this week? Well, well, exactly. So let, let me, fin let me finish. So the, by sending those invoices, the invoices are also very detailed and annotated. So every engineer puts in his time. This is what I worked on. This is what I did. So you see every engineer's work. It's very detailed. In fact, some of our clients use the invoices as part of their design history file. Interesting. Um, and um, 
So the point is that the customer over time gets into a cadence of and an understanding of the implications of their of their direction and the cost. And that tends and so when we start getting running out of money, we start saying, look, you know, we, we know three, four weeks in advance, look, we're gonna get to the end of this PO and we're not gonna be done. So we need a PO extension or we need whatever. And we don't really have any trouble with that to me, you know, honestly. Hmm. Interesting. But I've got a so I've got a question. This is fascinating. Weekly weekly billing, what how do you what do you say to them? if they give a little pushback like yeah we like to pay for all our services every month or something like this and because what you're what you're saying sounds great and i'm just trying to walk through how i would deal with my customers now maybe because some of my customers are really small but at the same time those are the ones who also lose track of what's going on exactly what getting they lose track the most easily because they may be brilliant surgeons or this or that but they're usually terrible project managers. I wouldn't well, imagine that they, that what do you say to they them? Have to, they don't have to pay weekly. They just are apprised weekly. Yeah, so that's so you can yeah. do a couple of things, right? You can do you can say you can give them a statement weekly, for example, um, that that shows the dollars, but is not an actual invoice. And then the invoice comes every month or something like that. But I think it's really important that they understand the run rate, the burn rate that they're that they're incurring. Uh, as it goes, because as they learn that, it really uh, informs them the impact of what decisions they're making. And so I think that's that's really the key. You include um, an analytic like we've now spent 38.5% of the budget, but we're only 23% of the scope done. No. Would that be helpful? No. We actually no. You know, uh, this kid. We're going to talk about this in one of my next slides. We're very. Uh, anti-reporting process <laughs> like to spend the time to do you know percentage calculations and do gantt charts and everything every week on yeah that's just I a waste of time because they're never going to be accurate yeah. so i think this way it's it's simpler and uh, we've just learned over time that this has worked the best Andre? Yeah, I can I can say from having been on the other side of the equation, uh, hiring somebody that was on fixed bid and getting an invoice at the end of the month, and you know having uh, my socks blown away in terms of the cost, um, I've definitely approached as I've been doing consulting, do everything on time and materials, but it's all about over communicating, um, and I definitely try to um, uh, provide you know weekly information if you know. Um, but not necessarily um, invoice on a weekly basis. Uh, do it every other week or twice a month or something like that. Um, but yeah, I found that that over communicating with the client and giving them here's what's going on prevents those end of the month uh, sticker shot conversations that nobody wants to have. Cool. Yeah, and, and Rick, that's exciting. Oh, and Rick, you were saying yeah. you were saying something that a lot of your clients are poor project managers that uh, rang a bell with me is that we're very very particular about who's project managing because if you don't have a good project manager on the other end you take a big risk of your project not being successful so you really need somebody good on the other end and that's one of our evaluation criteria in deciding who we work with nice if, so hmm. andre that's that's yeah. neat. oh go ahead yeah. okay, i'm sorry I, I just well no i just wanted to say one more thing about it it's really fascinating the whole weekly invoicing thing because I've got a guy who wants weekly reporting, but I realize that the most important part of that is probably going to be the the normal daily record of what I did during in how many hours during what days and how much it cost. I need to make sure that's in the weekly because it's online for him to look at all the time, but I'm finding out that a lot of them won't look at it very often. So I, no. so Corey, I agree with you. I think uh, I think I need to also include that. In my little one page weekly i mean and a dollar amount i, I think it's important because they'll look at the dollar amount i guarantee you that yep. yeah that's something that's more important than the hours can be yeah uh, just taking a step back of course i love to do time and materials and we've had some clients that did it that way but invariably right up front when you're pitching the project the, the customer wants to know well how much is this going to cost and how long is it going to take so how do you get over that hurdle i mean we we've We've gotten to the position where we've we've given five phases to a project and we'll give them an, a fixed cost on the first phase and try to get variable time and materials on the other. 
but even that they objected. So how do you get over that hurdle? Yeah, I think that's that's. I, I'm glad you brought that up, Andre, because I failed to mention it. Um, the the fact that we're timing materials doesn't mean it's just open season and uh, you know we're going to build everything we can on the project. We still provide estimates uh, and we work very hard to achieve those estimates, but we always just call them estimates because they're not they're not fixed cost. So okay. we do work to budgets, we do work to schedules, but they are estimates and it's time and materials. Great, okay, thought I was missing something. because No, you, you, we... you, you were absolutely not missing something and I failed to mention that. Okay, great, thank you. Jan, you are on mute. I'm not sure what I can say. I know when I have to give estimates and I call them estimates too and say, here's the max, if we go over it, um, we need to discuss so that we can expand the, the monies. And I, I, in packaging, people don't do design and development processes particularly well for the FDA. So I actually have forms that I just fill out at different stages to give to them. And then I force them to have design reviews for packaging, which they have never done before. Or I walk away from the client. I just, because then they get, they get mad because they don't understand what's being done or how it's being done. So, and it's been lovely. I have a hard time with it sometimes, but luckily I've been able to work the last nine years with people that know me and know that I'm honest about it. So. Yeah, I mean, reputation is everything in the in this type of business. So abs absolutely, um, I don't think uh, you know you develop a great reputation by having happy customers at the end of the project, not at the beginning of the project. And so I think you need to develop those relationships and that rapport with the clients. That's that's the name of the game. That's how referrals come. Omnica gets seventy percent of its business through referrals um, and repeat business. So it's because of 40, almost 40 years, 36 years now of, of doing that. Luke? Oh, uh, hi, York. Hi. All your points are so recognizable. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I'd like to add is that uh, we're sometimes confronted with uh, uh, optimistic or tight plannings. And you can see up front that they never will, will get that planning. They, they will always uh, exceed it. And then usually in the beginning, there are decisions made because of the unrealistic planning. But if you know up front that you would exceed it for, well, we, we as engineers, we always make a realistic planning and then uh, multiply it by three or by pi. And then we get a real realistic planning. But yes. if you know up front that it will take longer than your decisions in the first place to, to uh, th that you made because of the type planning became so if, at the end, they, they will, will hinder you in, in making your product right. Yeah, I think I think you can't be afraid to lose a customer. You just can't. Because if, if someone comes to us with an unrealistic schedule, and this is true of TechLex too, which is a small company in comparison to Omica, uh, I just go, look, you know, I can't do it. It, it. Here's what we can do. And if that's not good enough for you, then go somewhere else. I mean, it's, I mean you don't say that to them, obviously. It's a little more diplomatic, but that's the up, upside of it. Uh, you can't, and, and honestly, I think this is something that uh, Joe can probably relate to is um, being eager is not uh, a good uh, trait for in the sales, in the, in the sales world in this, in this service business. You can't be too eager. You need to. I'm not following. You mean to sign a client? Yeah. To win. You want to win so bad. You want it to get, you want to get it so bad. You need to kind of, step back and say, is this right for my company? And if it is, great. If it's not, great. You know, I'm, I'm trying to relate to... It's a sales thing. It's like customers smell your smell your desperation. But, but York, do you also, uh, if, if you present them with a realistic planning, can you then not also give them the extra opportunities it, it, it will offer? Say, you, you want to be on the market in, in nine months and it's totally unrealistic. They say, but if you, have it, if you take one and a half year, then you, don't, then you can offer them extra opportunities that you can. Yeah, I have to tell you, I have never had a client come to me with a realistic schedule. Never. Never. No. Never. They always come with, 
They're, well, their they're thinking typically is, I want to give an aggressive schedule because if we, you know, and that's so that we can get as close to that as possible. That's their thinking. But the reality is, is not, that's not how it works. There's a certain amount of work that has to go on no matter what. And that's going to take a certain amount of time. And a lot of that comes to, you know, again, a good client versus a not so good client. Good clients have experience, understand what it takes. Hopefully have done it before. Those are usually your best clients. The most educated ones are the best clients. The least experienced ones are, are usually your worst clients. It's dispiriting. I'm thinking about, you know, some of the folks in the group who are startups and they're promising investors we expect it to be here and here's the plan that we got from you know Jorg's group and we talked to them and we said nine months and nine months shows up and now it's 18 months I will be unrealistic. I well will, I'll you too. that's, that's I, true but you you know you'd rather be realistic they won't get there in nine months i don't care who they talk to so it doesn't really matter well, uh, the investor needs slides. to know that Pardon? Looking at your slides, some of your competitors are going to say, okay, nine months, we hear you. And then the yeah. switching costs are going to be too great, but they will have won the business and you didn't. So how do you as a, an ongoing enterprise balance well, things? Well, we want to win the job if we can you know, get them to understand how long it really will take. You, usually, usually the ones that are adamant about an unrealistic schedule are probably not customers we want anyway. But if, it, if they were, what I would say is, look, there are many things that we can do to satisfy your investors in advance of launching the product. You know, we can do uh, 3D renderings, we can do mock-ups, we can do um, study, uh, you know, study prototypes, and there's all these different things that you can do to, to give your investors comfort that the project's moving forward. So I would probably focus more on that than, no, you also yeah, we're going to- the car example where you ran out of money. All right. Investors mm -hmm. lose interest. Well, again, we tell people, yeah, you don't want them to lose in the investors to lose interest, of course. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's what I would, pro you know, I would counsel them, right? I mean, you know, I've seen so many startups, we've seen them all come and go a million times. You know, I would counsel them, give them my best advice. And if that's doesn't work for them or they decide, sometimes they go away. Like we had clients go away and then come back when they had the, enough capital to do the project properly. That's happened to us. So again, I think it's just being honest about what it really takes and um, and going from there. In the interest of time, Joanne, you had yep. a comment? Yeah, um, just this topic is really interesting for me because it was a big learning experience. Um, I worked for a company, the owner of the company had worked with the FDA for 10 years. And so she was doing regulatory work and I came in to help out. Like one of the items we, I helped out was um, a biological license application of BLA. So <clears throat> we had timesheets that we had to fill out because we had multiple projects that we could be working on. So if the first hour of the day was a particular project, I put the project name down, our number down, and what I was actually doing during that time. But the biggest learning experience through that was how much time it actually takes to do something. And you don't see it unless you actually write it down like that. And I think one of the great things about that is the timesheets can actually be passed to the customer, the client, so they can see during that out, well, maybe not all of it because they don't want to see the other stuff, but the applicable stuff. <laughs> um, they can see how much time it actually takes to do a particular review, write a document, um, whatever it might be. It could be multiple things. But... That, that's a really good point. I mean, I, and I didn't really think about that in terms of why this system works for us the way it does by giving them that knowledge, we do give them essentially the timesheet entries. We, we rewrite them because sometimes the engineers don't write in the best way that's acceptable to a customer, but we generally, uh, but it, it does give them some flavor of what it takes to do various tasks. And I think that's probably part of the education process and why the right. system has worked for us. And your, this information can be gathered and, tall and tallied so that for a particular type of project, you can see how long it actually takes to do so for a biological license application for this kind of product, it took us this many hours. And when we did the next one, it took this many. And you can then start to maybe even average them out and say, you know, on average, it's taking us this much time to do uh, this. Absolutely. In fact, we do do that. A lot of how we quote things is based on previous projects that are similar. 
That's okay. one of our input criteria. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Sanjeev, you've been patient. Yeah. So what I've found is, you know, when we raise money, it's important to actually tell the investors a realistic timeline and the, you know, the, uh, the advisors or the contractors give us the timeline. If, they, if you can give us more of a timeline with plus minus X amount, right? Then it actually helps because when I go to the VCs and I say, hey, we, I mean, our funding is given based on milestones. And if we don't hit the milestones, we don't get the funds and we are not able to move the project forward. And we had that happen at the at POC, right? Where we didn't hit the milestone because the product wasn't completed and the investors were unhappy and you know we had to beg, borrow and get the funds. But if there was a more realistic timeline which said, okay, you know, this can go up by 20% or 30%, then it's fine. Because then that's what you give to the investors and that's what they go with. So everyone's expectations are in line. But if you just say, hey, this is the timeline and reality is it can be 50% over or double the timeline. Right? And you, know, you're, you were speaking about this when you build your house or remodel that happened to me at my house as well. Right? Mm -hmm. It went up by 100%. So unfortunately, when you have the budget, you can control it. But when you're a startup and you're getting funds from investors, you don't have that much control. I uh, know it's very true. It's, it, it is very much a process of managing expectations and, and doing it in a way that um, that makes people feel comfortable. Some people will never feel comfortable and you will lose jobs. Others, other times um, they'll go, okay, this person's being honest with me and I, I need to, this is who I want to work with. So it can work in, in your favor and it can work against you as well. Yeah, and I've had that as well, where we had one contractor who said they'll do it a certain way we agreed to certain things and they were not doing that. Whereas we brought in another contractor and they did that. However, on hindsight, I would have gone with the, uh, with neither one of them actually, because <laughs> they, you know, they told me what I wanted to hear, not what would actually happen. Right. Right. And, uh, I had a right. prototype, uh, the comment I'd given earlier. Uh, but you're I not going to refer those two companies to anybody else, I assume. No, I wouldn't recommend it. Exactly. exactly. And that's that's the point, right? Right. Exactly. Thank you. Your take Thanks. us to point number nine. All right. So I <laughs> maybe this is revealing too much. Um, so I, I actually in my household, I never really minded doing dishes. I, I really don't mind it at all. I, I I enjoy doing dishes. But my, but you know, my wife, she just says, you know, you don't do them the way I want to do them. They're not clean the way I want them to clean. So I say, well, fine. And you, you do all the dishes. And so she does, she does all the dishes. I guess that works in my favor, but, but I, I, you know, I'm not going to fight her on it. So the same thing is true in, in product development. Um, you know, we tend to um, fall in love with our own projects, right? We've, we've invested time, we've done all these things and we don't want to relinquish control of it. Uh, you know, you may want to, um, let's see if there's actually, sorry. No. Um, you know, and, and you just, you, you have to let go to some degree uh, to people that know what they're doing and you got to give other people an opportunity to, um, to even improve on it or know more than you. So you have to have some humility. Uh, you don't necessarily have to control everything. You don't, you know, I noticed this a lot in, um, customers that come to us, they want to be geographically close to the development. Um, and I find it, especially today in the COVID you world, you know, stop this, in physically and yeah, well, they, they, that's what they think, but they never do that. So it's like, it, it's so it, it's, it's just kind of a, it's almost like a human comfort thing, but it doesn't really achieve what, what they think it does. So I think you can, especially today in the, in the world of zoom and, and COVID and how we're being able to be productive remotely. Uh, you don't really need to be right near your development partner unless there's some you know particular reason you've got a special lab or something like that, of course. Um, but you know, most most a, a professional organization doesn't really need you hanging around all the time. No offense. Dwayne, I know that your comment's a little off topic, but I'm curious about it. So tell them what you wrote in. Yeah, I just said you should get a smart sink. They're they're fantastic. What what is it? I put my dish in the sink 
I come back a day later and it's gone. It's really, really <laughs> nice. It sounds as though your wife did the dishes. Did you? It's exactly what it is. We joke that my <laughs> is part of it. And uh, I just put my dishes there. And then when I come back there, it's clean. It's amazing. It's, it's, it is it's amazing. Clean and put away. Yeah. So I do have to do the dishes here. I don't always want to. And between you, it sounds as though you've come up with some strategies I might employ. <laughs> it's, think, think about it. There's no negativity when you say, I have a smart sink. It's That's not right. It does the dishes. It's <laughs> a smart sink. We're going to, maybe in December, we'll have a, a session just about um, relationship we'll, management. We'll have a counseling session, Joe. Just call me and I'll charge you uh, for the time. Fair enough. <laughs> Number 10. Okay. So I used to run estate sales. I actually owned a franchise called Caring Transitions. What haven't you done, Jorg? I don't know. Uh, I haven't really done that much. I'm really not that interesting. But um, I, I had this franchise. I, I loved it. I was helping seniors relocate to senior living facilities. And then we did estate sales to help them sell all their belongings and so forth when they couldn't live at home anymore. Um, but what I noticed was, you know, they, you know, people were selling some just amazing things, you know, and we would price them and we would research them and try to put a good price on them. But I always thought, gosh, people just don't value this stuff at all. And I always thought that people are just so cheap, you know, it was, it was really discouraging because some of the stuff was beautiful. Like, you know, we had this pottery from Poland that this one lady had that was just, I mean, it was out of this world and people are just like, oh, can I buy this one piece for $2? And, you know, it was worth thousands. But anyway, I digress. So I thought that I, I think what happens is clients who are especially startups, I think they they put too high a value on the work, their ownership of, of their project. It's like I've put all this work in, I've done all this stuff and nobody could possibly uh, know as much about it as, as I do because I've gone through all this pain. And I, and I can just tell you from a, a service provider perspective, you know, don't kid yourself. Your stuff isn't really that unique. Most, I would say, ninety percent of everything we develop is a is a uh, iteration, iter of, something iteration of something else. And we've done it a thousand times. And you know, physics are physics. You know, a, a mechanism is a mechanism. You know, we don't. Um, so, so I think people tend to overvalue um, the the their projects. And it's like, well, if you didn't do exactly what I've done before, you couldn't possibly do my project, you know? So that, that I see that a lot and I, it's, it's just not true. I mean, you got to remember. If as an estate salesperson, you're aware of the Renoir discovered um, in the mantle over a house that is, he was liquidating his parents. Yeah. Home. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very rare that you find really valuable artifacts uh, but there's still a lot of great stuff i mean i tell you if you estate sales are a great place to buy stuff i'm just saying because you can get amazing beautiful things but everybody's getting rid of stuff these days so prices are very low okay i, I digress bring it on home so um just some things that i get asked a lot about you know i think i mentioned this early you know, what experience do you have with similar projects? What's your, you know, your portfolio? That's how people evaluate service providers. How fast, um, as I said here, 99% of the time it's an unrealistic schedule. We discussed that. I think references, people do ask for references and that's important. Um, I think if you're, if I look, if I switch seats and I say as a, as a, someone looking to buy services, I think I would definitely ask for references you know, look at LinkedIn, look at people who you know, who might know somebody in these organizations. Cost is actually, if you're doing product development in a startup or in other things, cost isn't really the number one factor. I mean, it's always important, of course, but speed is the most important thing. How fast can you get it done? And so we focus almost all on speed. So just some other thoughts I had, you know, if a company has high turnover, it usually means they have less experience. Um, if you have less experience, you probably need more process to to uh, overcome the lack of experience. More process is usually slower. Being slower is higher cost, obviously. 
um, more process is less creativity um, and less job satisfaction for engineers. So these are just some thoughts that we that we think about, um, you know, in order to try to create an environment that, of longevity. Just as an aside, Omnica's uh, average tenure here is 18 years, which is for a 30 person company, which is pretty astounding. <clears throat> so I finally brought it to the end. I'm sorry that I took so much time, but I'm, I appreciate it. Uh, we kept you here because you entertained us. And I really appreciate all the comments and, and, and they're good conversations. And if you have any questions, of course, you can reach me at these, uh, at these numbers. And then some references. I, oh, this is important. And I, I'm sure you'll get this presentation from Joe, but uh, take a look at a book called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. Kind of a funny name, A Corporate Fool's Guide to Surviving with Grace. Uh, this is um, really talks a lot about creating a, an environment of creativity and how process, you know, can suck you in to inefficiencies, process and hierarchy generally just that's why big companies have a hard time innovating. And so uh, something that we do a lot is, is try to eliminate as much process as we can. Uh, I'll throw this out there and you guys can talk to me later about it, but we are not ISO 13485 certified. I'm sure that's going to freak you out. 40 years of doing product medical device development. We can talk about that another time. Um, and uh, other things I, I found very interesting is this endowment effect of ownership. Um, you can, there's a link there that gives a good overview of that. So if you're interested, well, I'm done. That's quite a, that was quite an ending. <laughs> if you're interested, I'm done. Dun, 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 dun. Um, we are at an hour and a half, so I'm going to let people go. But um, you kind of dropped a uh, a little bit of a bomb there. At the, I did on the purpose. ninth minute where you said we're not 1345 certified. That's correct. I'm going to make an exception here, Rob. If you don't mind, I'm going to promote you. Rob <laughs> Hacker's domain name is 13485cert.com. Uh huh. There he so is. I think he has a, a point of view about your not certified shop. I'm sure. Mr. Packard. I'm, I'm not sure I'm in much different situation, even though my email says 1345cert.com. Um, my company isn't certified either. Um, neither one of us is a manufacturer of medical, medical devices. He's designing Correct. devices, and we're helping with regulatory submissions, and we partner with uh, companies like yours all the time, but uh, it's our clients that need the certification. That's correct. And that's our position as well. We certainly understand regulatory processes. We feed data into a client's uh, regulatory process, but we don't require, uh, we don't require it uh, on our end. So, and also if we had it, we would just be doing it in our process and then having to transfer to the client and change it over into their process. Uh, it's just a waste of effort. And this is one of the reasons why we're not so big on the process side of things because our client is the one who, and, and you know, those processes in general were designed for manufacturers uh, originally. And so they have, so the requirements from a design history perspective are not that difficult to provide that data, whether it's meeting minutes, whether it's um, whatever it is, reports, uh, FMEA reports, whatever it is. So these are, that's why we don't do it because it, it, it slows things down from our perspective to getting a design done. I'm going to invite you to a conversation where uh, it'll be called to 1345 or not to 1345 <laughs> with another okay. MDG premium member who just got his shop certified. I know, Jose is very yes. pleased I, about it. And so, well, he should be. It's a lot of work, and uh, I'm sure I've done it. I've also done it in previous jobs when I owned uh, synchronous product development in Colorado. We, we went through the process, and uh, so I've been through the process. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, okay, small world. Yeah. We we go through the whole entire process um, every single quarter, if not almost monthly, with different clients. But um, for ourselves, um, we we don't manufacture anything, and the services we provide are um, nobody really would want to pay the overhead for us to go through the certification process. Exactly. Joanne pitches that she can help you get 1345 ready. But I think no, thanks. <laughs> we, yeah. we don't want it. <laughs> we did 1345. 
So anyway, thanks you get everyone for their attention, especially going this late. So uh, this is very entertaining it. and uh, educational. Rick gives you an amen. I'm not sure about what, but <laughs> um, all right. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you guys. Week, our friend is Monir calling in from Paris. Oh, well, nice. Paris for France. No more secrets with EU economic operators. So stay tuned for that and uh, make it a great week, everyone. Thanks. I, I really enjoy these meetings. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, bye for now.